Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Lexi. So I'm a th software en engineer at Thinksell. The talk has absolutely nothing to do with Thinksell. I uh, just want to mention that we're hiring people. We've got some pretty cool C++ code, so if you want to come work with me. Um, I'm also no blogging at that URL, so if you follow me. And I've got one Thinksell uh, rain code that I don't want to take with me, so if you're interested, grab it after the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about Lexi. Absolutely nothing to do with Thinksell. It's my personal project I started before. Um, Lexi is a C++ parser DSL library. And it's essentially syntax sugar for a recursive descent parser. So it allows you to parse stuff, but it doesn't use some abstract parser combinators, uh, some abstract parser generator stuff where we've got weird shift reduce errors or whatever. It's just syntax sugar for a recursive descent parser. Um, this means you've got full control over branching decisions and backtracking, um, and you can pass that directly into your own data structures without intermediate copies. It also has advanced features like automatic error recovery. Um, so essentially, it gives you the flexibility and control of a handwritten parser without boilerplate. So to use Lexi, you need three things. You first define the grammar, then you create the input, and then you call a parse action. So let's say we want to parse like a CSS color into this struct. So like hash and then a thing, and then we pass that into struct RGB. Um, so first step, define the grammar. Um, the grammar consists of productions, and in Lexi, they are structs. So we've got our structs, and they've got define a rule and a value. So the rule defines using Lexis DSL how to pass the thing. So in this case, we want to pass a hash sign and then three color channels. And a channel itself is another production whose rule says, OK, we want to pass two hex digits and convert that into u and 80 integer. This will then produce a u and 80. Um, and then the value is just a callback that forwards it uh, as is. So when we pass our color, it will pass three channels. Each of those channels will produce a u and 80. And we then use that to construct the color. So then we create an input. For example, we can just pass a string literal, or we can read from a file and use the file contents for our input, or we can pass an arbitrary iterator range, or we can pass the command line arguments. So various inputs, uh, and then we call a pass action. So in this case, we want to pass something into data, so we call Lexi pass, give it the entry production of our grammar, give it the input, and give it like an error handler that, in this case, the default one just uh, prints out the error on the Tumblr. Um, and then we're checking whether we have a value, and if so, we can use it. And this also demonstrates a bit of error recovery here. So we've got like a syntax error in the end, so we get an error message printed to standard out, and, and the parser recovered a bit and still is able to produce like a partial color, um, which is sometimes useful. If you don't want error recovery, you can just check for has success instead of has value, and then you will not continue um, with like partially produced values. You can also pass, create, for example, a pass tree. So this will pass the same grammar into pass tree, which you can then visualize. Um, so this is a pretty efficient data structure. It is a lossless representation of the entire input, using, including white space and all that stuff. Or um, if you don't know exactly what's going on with your grammar, you can call Lexi trace, um, and this will debug the grammar, and Lexi will print out on the terminal exactly what it did at any point. Um, so as we can see, we can have the, like, the error recovery here at the bottom. So we get the error message, and then error recovery uh, still continue at the single digit. And you, you can also add like print statements to a grammar, uh, which will then show up in this trace. So if you want to f figure out what's going on. Um, so it, it's important to point out that Lexi is not declarative. Um, so when, when we've got a regex, A star A, um, this will match the one or more A's. Um, but the equivalent code in Lexi will not match anything. Um, this is because Lexi is syntax sugar for a handwritten descent parser. So when you want to say while A and then another A, this directly translates to while A and then another A. And obviously, we will not match an A after we've consumed all the A's. So this will never match anything. Uh, similarly, when we have branches, so regex A or AB matches A or AB. Uh, but in Lexi, this only matches A. Um, because syntax sugar, right? We've matched an A, so, so this matches, so we will never consider the second branch. This is because Lexi will never backtrack for you, unless you explicitly tell it to backtrack. So decisions are made using branch conditions. This can either be individual tokens, like literals or um, SK character classes and stuff like that. Um, so essentially, LL1 look ahead. Or you want, when you want to do backtracking, you have to say, for example, peak. Peak checks where the rule would match, then backtracks, and then that branch is considered taking. And you can combine a branch condition with the rest of the rule using the shift operator. Um, so this will match condition, and if so, it will then continue with the branch. Otherwise, it will pick the next one in the choice. So when we may want to pass, for example, um, also the function called syntax, uh, we need two branches. So the first one, we, the condition is the hash sign. So when we've got the hash sign, we will pass the three channels. And then the second one, when we've got the RGB, 
uh, then we can pass uh, the, the channels separated by commas. Um, and then we have a choice in, at the end. So this will not do any backtracking because both of those branch conditions can be just checked as is. Um, and this gives you like full control over when exactly backtracking happens and how choices are being made. So some other features, um, Lexi can be used to pass text. It has Unicode support. It has compile time access to the character property database. Um, it has basic rules to pass like nested structures, quotes, escape sequences, and so on. It has automatic white space skipping. Um, you can use it to pass programming languages. I've written three compilers on top of Lexi. Um, it supports keyword and identifier parsing. Um, you can specify operator precedence, and then it will just figure out how to pass those. You've got automatic error recovery. You can pass binary input. It's a pretty cool library. So on the implementation side, Lexi is built on top of parser combinators. So a parser is a function, um, oh, there's meant to be a bool there. Um, so it's a function that takes a reader and returns true or false depending on when it's matched. Um, and then we can combine multiple parsers together by a, with a function that takes a bunch of parsers and returns a combined parser that, for example, parses them in sequence. And traditionally, this would be implemented using lambdas and higher order functions. So we can imagine that the parser combinator returns a lambda that combines all the parsers. Um, but this is nice for like functional languages, but in C++ it's at the overhead. So in Lexi instead, I use empty types, which are then entirely composed in the type system. So for example, this is the rule that parses a single literal character. It's an empty type, so all the specification is in the type. Uh, and then it has a pass function that takes the reader, checks whether we've got that character, and if so, we bump it and continue, otherwise we return false. And then the thing at the bottom, this is the DSL object. It's just an empty variable that we're using uh, in our signature. And for example, a sequence is a parser combinator. It takes two rules and parses them in sequence. Right? And this composes nicely into empty types. It has, doesn't have any overhead because it's just the entire grammar is composed in the type system. Now the question is, how do we produce values? Um, so when we want to pass an integer, for example, we skip our digits, and then we get our integer, and then what? How do we return that integer? Um, this signature doesn't give us a return channel. And well, we could just say, well, let's just return it, right? So our parser returns an optional T. And then we can compose them again. But the problem with that is, well, what are values are being returned? So like for an integer, it's the int. Uh, but for a literal rule, it's nothing. Uh, so we can return void, except we can't have an optional void, so let's return an uppercase void, which is just an empty type. Okay, it's a bit awkward, but it could work. Um, well, and then for sequence, we need a tuple, because we've got zero more things, so we put them in a tuple. And then for choice, we've got a variance, because we've got one of those things. And then for a dynamic sequence, we use a std vector. And okay, um, but then we've got rules like this, where we've got a bunch of literals with a choice. And this can produce a type like that, which is a tuple of variants of tuples of voids. And this isn't really nice to use. So we can start, OK, let's get rid of all the voids, because we don't need them, and then simplify it. But there's still a tuple of variants. And I want to pass them into our own data structures without copies. So how do I do that? And I didn't, really didn't want to go down that road. Um, so instead, I took inspiration from senders receivers, um, which are used for asynchronous programming. So there we've got a sender, which describes work that, that should be done. Um, and we've got receivers, which are just callbacks that receives the result. And then we connect the sender and the receiver, and then we can start executing the connected thing, and this will produce work from the sender and pass that on to the receiver and do something else. And this crucial idea that we've got the separate thing that we need to connect, and then we got a callback, really solves our problem. Because callbacks are really useful, because for example, we can easily express voids. So void just means instead of don't do anything, just invoke the callback with no values. Um, to have a tuple, well, we invoke the callback with all of those values. We don't need to create a tuple, we can just use multiple arguments. And to have a choice, we don't need a variant, we can just have an overload set, invoke the callback with one of those types. And so this means that our rules now look like this. So the rule on itself knows how to pass itself, but it needs to be connected with a continuation. This is done by instantiating the struct p with the next parser, which has the pass function. Uh, the pass function now takes a context, which will just pass on, and all the previous arguments. It will then do its own matching, and when it succeeds, it will call the next parser pass function, giving it all the previous arguments and our current value. Uh, and that way, we can compose the thing and got the channel to produce the values. So the integer rule just uses that to produce the result, pass it on to the next parser. 
Uh, and the calculator rule, which doesn't produce any value, well, it just calls next parser with all the previous arguments and doesn't add anything else. And because this is initially empty, empty if nothing produces any values, we just never add any arguments. And the cool thing is about sequence. So sequence passes R1, then R2. So for that, we need to connect R1 with a continuation that passes R2 and then passes the next parser. And this doesn't add any code, right? We just created a type. And when we call pass on this type, we call pass on R1, which does something, then calls pass on R2, which does something, then calls pass on next parser. And all the arguments are nicely chained through, and in the end, we invoke it with all the values. And so this is the final parser. It just doesn't have any continuation. It just receives all the arguments and invokes the callback. And this is the callback that's specified in the grammar, and it will produce the final value, which is then stored in the context and returned to the user. So when we go back to the th this thing, instead of having tuples and variants and so on, we're just having two overloads. We either invoke the callback with two ints when we take the first branch, or we invoke it with one int when we just take the second branch. And we've got nice representation of all the values without having to store them in anything else, because we can just store them in the overload set, which is really cool. Now, you might notice that um, I've used this reader instead of just iterators. So why did I use the reader with the peak and the bump method? Well, I wanted to have a REPL. This REPL should dynamically request more input. So it initially prompts a prompt character and asks for one line of input, and then it starts parsing it. And when it reaches the end of the input of that line, it prompts for more input by just printing something again and asking the user to enter another line. And only when the user didn't, doesn't want to enter any more input have we considered reached EOF, and then it's an error because we wanted to read my input but didn't get anything. And so let's try and write iterator and sentinels for that. So an input iterator, three operations, operator star, operator plus plus, and operator equals equals. And in one of those operations, we need to check uh, and prompt for the next line. So let's say we want to prompt for the next line in operator plus plus. So we've got operator star, which just returns the current thing in our buffer. And when we, we increment it, we check whether we reach the end of the buffer. And if so, we request the next line from the user to fill our buffer again. OK, now consider this code. This wants to pass ABC. So we check whether we've got A, and if so, we consume it. We check whether we have B, if so, we consume it. We check whether we have C, if so, we consume it. But this final consume might prompt for the next line of the input which is not what we want, because we're done at this point. We don't want to ask the user to enter anything else, because we successfully passed what we wanted to pass. So we can't prompt in operator plus plus, because we would always add this additional line. OK, uh, so let's say we request more input in operator star, uh, because we're not going to call star on the final thing, like after the end, because we're done. So this might work. Well, but what about this thing? So we just want to skip over everything. And depending on how the check works, this might either be an infinite loop or end prematurely. So we can't really prompt in star anything, because we not, don't need to call star in the iter iterator model. Well, so where do we prompt for more input then? Well, we can do it in operator equals equals, which is like the final thing. I mean, it works. It's just really weird that we've got an inter iterator who does all the important work in equals equals. It just uses the fact that you have to call equals equals before you can do anything else, and just happens to work, but it's not really nice. So this iterator model doesn't really fit the input that I wanted to do, which is where I wrote this reader struct, which has a peak and a bump, and the peak can safe, safely request more input. And with that, I'm done. So lexi net it has an interactive playground on the website. You can enter a grammar, you can enter an input, you can see the pass tree, you can see the trace. So just try it out if you want to pass anything. And I've got 10 seconds for questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>